So I'm Kelly Pollack. I'm Associate Dean of Students in the Social Sciences, um, and I'm really excited about this whole series of presentations we're doing, and especially about this one. Uh, so just to sort of put this in context a little bit, we have an initiative that started this year uh, with the Dean of the Social Sciences, Mario Small. It's called the Emerging Leaders Initiative. You've probably started to hear some things about it. Um, and there are sort of a few goals of it. Um, one goal is to uh, reduce time to degree for our PhD students, um, not artificially, not in a way that makes them get a lesser degree, but in ways that means like removing obstacles uh, from completion. Another goal of the program, and this is where this comes in, is increasing opportunities for professional and personal development. And so that's why we're doing this series of events. And then the third goal, sort of more broadly, is just improving the lives of our graduate students uh, in the social sciences. And so uh, some of you probably participated in a survey back in December. We're looking at the results of that, looking at ways that we can improve lives of graduate students in various, you know, sort of low-hanging fruit kinds of ways, um, but also big picture kinds of things. What can we do to make lives better? Um, and uh, there were a number of summer grants, research grants last year that were given out, and there will be again this summer and into next year. And so those are all driven by this initiative as well. Uh, so this series of events that we're doing, the, the personal and professional development side of things, we're calling the Leadership Lab. Um, and so it's on a number of different topics, topics that we've heard from students are of interest, are things that they want to know more about, um, or areas of concern for them. Uh, so we're really excited about this session. There's another session next Friday that will be announced later today, uh, and that's about managing anxiety. And that's something, especially I think in 10th week, that people are thinking a lot about. Uh, and we'll have lunch with that one, so even more food. Um, but today we're going to be talking about research in the digital age. Uh, this is something that's becoming increasingly important. It's something that we're hoping we can sort of fill in gaps in knowledge that um, perhaps even your faculty members don't know a lot about or don't think a lot about because this isn't something that was a matter of concern when they were coming up in graduate school. Uh, so we have two uh, presenters here today that um, are going to talk to you and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards for any questions that you might have. Uh, so our two presenters are Renee Foster, who's our Director of Communications in the Social Sciences. Um, and so she has uh, a lot of thoughts on various ways that uh, perhaps we should be communicating, <laughs> uh, whether or not that's the way we always are. Um, and then also Monica Mercado, who is a history uh, PhD student, about to graduate very soon, and who will be taking uh, a job that she can tell you a little bit more about um, starting in July, I think. So I will turn it over to Renee now. So uh, I've been with the university for almost, no, just over 10 years. Um, I started in the provost office working with the provost um, on media initiatives. So it was 10 years ago, the university was doing absolutely nothing. There was no YouTube. There was nothing really being done at all. And so we did a bunch of pilot projects and figured out that what campus was kind of hungry for was video. Um, in, in a lot of different ways. It was showcasing the work that was being done here primarily, so um, creating a bigger stage for our researchers to, and scholars to actually show their work to a more broad audience. A lot of, um, for example, a lot of uh, grants require some kind of outreach component, and so a lot of the work that we started doing in the provost office was actually helping faculty members figure out how to meet those requirements. And it ended up being one of the easiest and most descriptive tools was um, video. So a lot of the work I've done in the last 10 years has been video here on campus. Um, but in the last year, I've started doing a lot more strategy work too. So um, even before I joined uh, the uh, Division of Social Sciences, I was doing central communication strategy work. So. Apparently, I'm not good at talking and doing things on my computer at the same time. So hang on real quick. Let's go back. Um, so um, that's who I am. Uh, so now we're doing a lot more. I'm, part of my role is to actually try to help support faculty, uh, PhD students who are trying to better communicate their own work and things like that. So uh, Kelly invited me here today to talk a little bit about uh, a, a newer trend in um, journal publication and uh, disseminating research, which is the video abstract. Uh, 
before we knew that's what it was called, we've been producing these and just calling them short documentary style interviews with faculty members, <laughs> basically. But it is, it's, a, it's a video abstract. So it's a, um, a short, concise message about what your, the core nuggets of your research, um, usually geared towards a slightly broader audience. It's a little bit more understandable. So before we even do that, though, I'm going to make the case for video because um, statistics help make the case for it. Um, I don't think everyone entirely realizes how much video is being consumed online and how big part of our media diet it is. Like general public, academics, everyone is, do, is consuming media all the time. So this um, statistic is just for the month of January of 2014. Um, the arrows are indicating that it's up quite a bit. So. Um, from one year previous, January 2013, um, there was 180 million U.S. viewers watched 36.2 billion videos. Um, so you can see that, I mean, it is increasing every year, right? And it's only going to keep going. It, and the, the important part of this is kind of what they're watching, for us anyway. Like, you know, it doesn't matter if they're all just watching YouTube videos of cats. Um, but in fact, 50% of all the video being watched online is actually educational content. That's really important for us, especially if we're producing video that can be understood by a broader audience. Um, and as you can see, this is also up quite a bit. Um, what's interesting about this, though, is that it's in the top three types of all content being watched, but we're right behind how-to videos, which is uh, a little strange. And it was also a new category in 2008, I think. So um, it it's... It's a little weird. I mean, but people are looking for educational content and they're watching it. So that's really crucial. Um, so the reason we need to care about this so much is because um, the way your work will be found is increasingly going to be through video because that's the way people are looking for content, period, right? So it's a little bit about exposure and just playing the odds. but. Um, Things like the fact that having a video associated with something does increase your rankings in Google. So if somebody's searching for your, a topic connected to your work, if there's a video that you've posted that is key, you know, tagged with those words, there's a better chance your work is going to come up sooner. Um, and of course, the more people who find your video, um, it will direct people to your technical paper, ideally. So if they watch your video, even if it's only the first minute and really think it's interesting, it will drive them to your paper, which is important for citations, which is, of course, going to hopefully get you a big, awesome job, um, or if not your first job, your second job. Um, and it also helps with future employers finding you. So that, of course, you know, positioning yourself, like even before you've done pub actually published work, if you do create like a job market video or something like that, and there are uh, universities searching for a specific field or specialization and you come up, that's only going to be good for you in terms of exposure. Um, and of course, along, like in the long run, it could also increase the number of collaborators you will have because they will be finding you too. So not just citations, but also people you may eventually do research with. YouTube being the second most popular search engine is strange and uncomfortable <laughs> because I don't really, I don't really know how that's working. Um, except for the fact that research abstracts are becoming a genre of their own, even on YouTube. So it, it is something we're thinking about. Um, so this is a quote from George Whitesides, who's a chemistry professor at Harvard. Um, he is requiring all of his students to do three minute video abstracts of their research as part of their coursework. And uh, the reason really is because it makes you think about your own work in a different way and often in a more concise way. Um, so if for no other reason, it's really good for you. <laughs> it's good, you know, to like help you think through your own work. Okay, so um, a video abstract um, is really kind of what I said before. It can be a short interview with somebody. It can be uh, something self-produced, or it could be uh, slightly more professionally produced. Um, so we have some resource resources. We can do slightly maybe higher level production work and stuff like that. But really, um, and I have a link to a great tutorial at the end of the presentation, you could do it on 
a mobile device or an iPhone or an iPad um, using free software, as long as you kind of adhere to a few kind of tips and rules about like not standing in front of a window when you record yourself and using a microphone and things like that. Um, but really, they shouldn't be a huge burden to produce. You don't have to worry about creating something that can air on you know, the Discovery Channel or something like that. It's really meant to be a short, quick, concise overview of your own research. And it's extra helpful when you've got something to demonstrate. So the reason video abstracts have been really popular in the physical sciences before they've moved into the social sciences is that often there's something to physically demonstrate in biological and physical sciences. Now, um, that's changing. It's, it is becoming more increasingly popular in the social sciences too, especially because we are starting to work with big chunks of data. Well, not start, we've been. Um, but sometimes animating data is actually a nice way of showing, you know, longitudinal change or things like this that can happen over time and space, um, geographical change, things like that. because that's the kind of stuff that a journal will be excited about when you're sending in your work and things like that, if you've got that kind of stuff to include. So I can show a quick clip. So we uh, helped, I don't know, uh, some of you may know Gordon Douglas. He's uh, Department of Psycho or, sorry, Sociology. Um, he, he had a paper accepted to uh, City and Community, and he came to us and asked us if we could help him a little bit because City and Community, the journal, asked for a video abstract to post with his article. Um, now, the, the interesting thing about this is that they only choose one right now um, per publication cycle, and they chose his mostly because his topic already had a visual component to it. So he um, was writing on uh, do-it-yourself urban design, which is kind of uh, public interventions in urban planning when cities won't kind of take care of something and the residents step up and do something. So I can start playing a bit of it. The homemade sign behind me is a perfect example of the sort of entirely unauthorized and yet explicitly functional and civic-minded interventions that I call DIY urban design. Now there are numerous ways in which people make illegal or unauthorized alterations to urban space, from graffiti and street art to large-scale political occupations, and my research actually started out looking at many of these. But I began to feel that the emphasis on vandalism and disorder on the one hand, or radical critical resistance on the other, was missing out on something else. The efforts of those who see something in need of improving in their communities and choose to do it themselves without asking permission. I wanted to know what motivates these people to effectively do urban planning and design work themselves. Who has the resources and the privilege to do this? And in what context do these efforts appear to be happening? I talked with dozens of do-it-yourself or DIY urban designers in cities in the US, Canada, and beyond. Uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll stop it there just to um, give you at least a flavor of what some of these can look like. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing about his, obviously, is that he kind of really went slick with it. Like, there's music, there's, uh, he actually, uh, he's in Brooklyn, so he worked with a filmmaker friend to do the shooting. Um, so he took it um, a little bit further. He did a full storyboard for this and worked, we worked with an editor that is a partner of ours and, and to, to really package it really nicely. Um, and it's been great. It's been doing really well for journal traffic and things like that and his personal traffic. Um, but there's, the alternative is doing something far simpler in uh, production quality, which is something more like this. Now, this is my husband. I'm using him as a, an example because I shot this for him and it was, this is like one of the more recent things I've done. So I figured it was a good example. Um, but literally, uh, it, it took 45 minutes to shoot it, a couple hours to edit it, and got it up on YouTube really quickly. And it's part of his job market site and things like that. And literally shot it in our living room. I mean, it was like not really high quality. We don't, didn't do any of the you know music or anything like that. Uh, well, let me show you. But what he did include, because he has them, are animated so maps. Oops, sorry, I was going to try to skip forward to the animated map part at least. So there's some. Sorry. There's some B-roll, which is, you know, we went and actually, he he talks about 
uh, smoking policy in bars and restaurants and things like that. So we went and actually shot some B-roll, which only took another 15 minutes or so. So it wasn't really super highly produced. Um, it was quick to edit, and we used really like minimal software package, like what we have in the dean's office, which is just Final Cut. Um, you can do everything that we did in this video using like uh, iMovie. I mean, really, we didn't do anything super sophisticated here. So it's just an, a, an alternative example to the high, highly produced version. Um, so quickly, uh, this is the scary part, is the skills <laughs> part, right? So if you haven't ever shot any video and you haven't ever made anything through any of these software packages, how hard is it really? Um, and it's not. It isn't. It, there is a learning curve, but you can do it and you can figure it out. And there's great tutorials. Um, but you do need some equipment. Um, and uh, I have a tutorial link at the end here that shows you how to produce a video abstract using your iPhone and iMovie. So it's entirely possible and it can still look really good. Um, the basics of what you're going to need, you are going to need some you're going to need a camera, whether it's a phone or an iPad or uh, a DSLR or something like that. And you need something to put it on. Try not to shoot it handheld. That's my big tip for you. If, unless you're a filmmaker for many years, shooting handheld is rough. And it's going to look amateur, unfortunately. So do find some kind of camera support, whether it's a Gorillapod or, um, and I'll explain what that is, uh, or a tripod. Use a microphone. That's, I know that's also a kind of a tricky part, but you can get cheap microphones that will plug into your iPhone and make such a huge difference in the quality and the listenability of your video. Uh, people in the industry often say uh, that the eye forgives, but the ear doesn't. That's, so audio is very important. Try to get that right. Um, you can fudge on the, you don't need transitions or any of the fancy like video stuff, but the audio needs to be good. Um, so suggestions, iMovie is free. Final Cut's more expensive, but it's not terribly expensive um, compared to what software packages used to be anyway for video editing. Um, and then I wanted to, I'm going to reinforce this a couple times. Logan Center has everything you need, and they have really nice stuff too. So you can do all this stuff over at Logan. You can borrow their equipment. Um, they've got way nicer cameras than what your iPhone will produce and stuff like that. It is a little more complicated. So if you want to do this quick and fast, I'd say, Experiment with actually shooting some video on your phone or your, an iPad or something like that. Um, so gear suggestions. This, you aren't going to want to pay attention to this right now. I will post all this later, so you can kind of look through it if you want to. Um, but there are some recommendations here for like, you know, if, if say you're planning to buy yourself a camera anyway, like the Panasonic Lumix FZ200 can pretty much do everything you want it to do. And the reason I chose that one is because it has an audio input, so you can actually attach an external microphone, which a lot of DSLRs don't. So I've tried to choose wisely in terms of my recommendations for gear. Um, again, you can do all the stuff at Logan, and they do some training there too. So if you are not comfortable with how to use a camera or how to arrange, set up an interview and things like that, they can certainly do that. And I've got, um, I wrote up a document not long ago, a couple years ago, <laughs> Um, that's actually like best practices for shooting simple video. So I will post that. We can post that on the site as well. Um, so in terms of where to start, how much time do I have? Sorry. OK. So I, I think you know, the technical stuff you can learn. What's going to make a good video, though, is really getting to the core nugget of your research, and that is the hardest thing for anyone to do. Whether you're new in, as a scholar or you've been doing this for 40 years, um, boiling down your research into a couple concise nuggets is excruciatingly difficult, like for anyone. So that's part of what makes this a really interesting exercise about understanding your own work, is can you get it down to a couple sentences? Like, what's your elevator pitch for your own research kind of thing? Um, and once you get there, you need to find the story. So when I say story, I mean like, even a video abstract should have some kind of narrative. It should have some kind of dramatic tension. And I, I say that, I'm using that term really loosely, because you're not going to get a lot of dramatic tension in a video <laughs> abstract. But, but you can do a few things that actually, like, uh, like Gordon did. Um, 
he he mentioned that like there is this like gap of knowledge like we don't understand why these people are doing this it's kind of a mystery and that's what i'm going to go figure out so like he structured his video almost like a mystery narrative right like i'm going to figure out this strange behavior these people are doing so there's a few tips um you know i just mentioned the kind of state the whole and the common understanding um but you can always start a video like this with a question and your research is probably addressing a question, so that's usually a good place to start. Or if there's an unusual or particularly interesting aspect to your work. So uh, research in strange places, like we had somebody studying the sewers under Paris, things like that. Like if you, if you have a really dramatic environment you're in or something like that, that can also be a good hook for your video abstract. The other one, and the reason I highlighted this, is uh, following a personal narrative um, means often starting with what was the moment that made you decide to dedicate your life to studying something. And it's often um, personally dramatic, but it's also really interesting to people. What motivated somebody to like partake in this particular field and this niche research? Um, so using that personal narrative, uh, it makes you human. It makes you interesting as a person. Um, and then if you are crafting a social media kind of persona, which Monica will talk probably a little bit about in blogging, and we could probably dedicate a whole thing to just talking about how to craft your, your media narrative. But um, using this is actually kind of a nice hook, too. Um, it, it also shows that you are can articulate your ideas concisely, which is makes you a good teacher. Um, and people care about that if you can stand in front of people and actually describe things in a in a way that's engaging and simple. Um, but also, um, this may be a little bit down the road for you, but it shows that you're a good interview. And so when you're working for an institution that does have media attention, it shows uh, Journalists are more often to ask you for an interview if they see a video clip of you speaking articulately and presenting well on camera. So it positions you well for that. Um, so uh, the next step would be to, uh, so like I said, Gordon actually did a full storyboard. He was very deliberate in how he wanted his entire video laid out and mapped out. Um, when I shot the video for my husband, we did it like an interview. There was no storyboard. We sat down, I interviewed him, and then I crafted the narrative that made the most logical sense. So you can do it either way. Um, the second way, um, well, not necessarily. There's time, you're either gonna spend the time ahead of time building that storyboard, or you're gonna spend the time going through that footage and figuring out how to string together the pieces. It's, it's a trade-off. I think that when you're starting out making video, doing the storyboard activity is probably more efficient. So I would recommend that. Um, and then determine what kind of media assets you have that you can put into this video. So think through, um, while you have a camera, whether you're borrowing it or using your own, figure out if you can just shoot a few things that kind of demonstrate or illustrate the things that you're talking about in your research. And that can be pretty abstract, and I know that. So it, you may also just want to look through photography, archival images, sometimes pieces of documents make really good you know, demonstration on, in video. Um, and in a pinch, and when concepts are particularly complicated, doing some simple definitions on screen can also help too. So that's another way to kind of add some visual interest to the flow of your, your video abstract. So um, I have not nearly enough time to actually get into showing you how to produce one of these um, because I could I've done workshops on stuff like this and it's you could do three workshops of three hours each almost it, it can be quite a while but there's some really nice simple guides um, and this the one the scientist videographer how to make a video abstract for an external article is really well done so um, I wasn't going to reinvent the wheel and basically redo everything she already did because she did a really nice job um, so if you're looking for like a quick tutorial on just the basics and she does her demonstration on an iPhone, which is great. So using iMovie and an iPhone and some really cheap equipment, she gets really nice results. And so 
I'm really glad that she did the, the demonstration that way because it, it makes it more accessible. Um, and then uh, also, if you really need help, I'm a resource. Um, and I can certainly work with you if you need some help, you want to get started, you know you have a, a paper or a piece of your research or even you're thinking about wanting to do like your job market paper, do a short video around that, I can certainly help you think through the best way to do it um, or even help you do it. <laughs> and I, there's a small room here, so I can say that. <laughs> um, I know, right? Um, but but at least I can point you in the right direction and uh, start helping you with that. Um, so if you aren't necessarily publishing right now, but you still want to try doing sort of a video abstract style video about your work, there are some places you can put it that aren't necessarily journals. So um, the university has channels that, and we distribute video all the time that we produce on these channels, and we'd be thrilled to have work done by graduate student researchers <laughs> that we can put up. Um, we also have partnerships with um, Futurity.org and uh, Science360, which is, Science360 is actually an NSF. It, they don't focus on just physical sciences. They'll take research, and it doesn't even have to be NSF-funded research. They're just trying to build a repository of interesting work, so that's an option. Um, Futurity comes out of, it's a multi-institution partnership uh, to create a research video portal and story portal because there was so much collapse in the bigger news media that there weren't as many people talking about science research anymore. So they created their own basically site, you know, just to kind of help fill that gap a little bit. And it's, it's actually pretty nice. Um, and then locally we work with um, uh, some, you know, local me media. So, we can always pitch things to them, um, but we can get anything on Can TV. And, and I know Can TV sounds kind of hokey, but um, we actually get pretty good viewership on that. And it goes to a lot of households in the area. So it's just another interesting way of getting your work out there and seen. Um, we've been dreaming for years of doing like a regular one hour program where we can put a bunch of cool stuff that's happening here at the university on there. So. Um, if we start thinking that there's people interested in producing these videos that we can contribute, then that may move forward.